or names which are like people that we start the discussion. Uh, and after that, you are all invited to join and contribute so that we have a kind of really uh, more interactive session. It doesn't mean that we didn't have. I mean, we did have, but this is a really, uh, you don't have excuse. Uh, unfortunately, Eric Berkloff uh, couldn't come for entirely private reasons, which I will not explain now because they're too kind of, um, well, house moving and so on. But uh, Peter Sante kindly agreed to replace him, and because he is uh, really um, behind all the activities in the bank and is very much involved, that's uh, very good. And we also have uh, uh, Mr. Bauman. Christopher, who is also from the uh, EBRD uh, here. So we kind of have a, a fair representation of, of different views, positions. Uh, so I will start now to kickstart the discussion, just a few minutes uh, of, the, of the kind of the, the, the major issues, how I would see them. And then I will give floor to uh, Justin. And then we also have a special invited panelist, Daniel Dayanu. Uh, who will be then talking second, Michael third, and then we give enough chance to Peter to, to, to collect and, and then have his uh, uh, view on the issues. So we organized this workshop in the context where uh, we feel that there is uh, some kind of uh, paradigm change. Well, it's not the field, you can see it, you, you read it, you know. Uh, and uh, we lived for uh, 15, 20 years in the context of the um, policies where there was a heavy focus on structural reforms and horizontal policies. I nicely put it as a kind of old man, middle aged man, whatever, but it's a kind of established uh, a policy program. At the same time, uh, there is always in the discussions uh, uh, references to the old style industrial policies and a big push. Uh, picking winners whenever you have a meeting with economists, that is the first thing which is kind of opposing to each other and there is this uh, uh, battle of, 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 of two views and I call it the straw man because the, in my view the conditions for, for that type of policies are already gone long ago because in the globalization context whatever you do about policy you have to think in a new way and that's where the kind of this uh, workshop comes with the idea to explore the kind of alternatives to that and alternatives uh, are not from today, they have been on the, on the market, let's call it, or ideas already for some time. Uh, ideas related to so-called new industrial policies, as uh, um, people would call them related to Daniel Rodericks. Then we had a very articulate ideas of new structural economics. And then we also have today these ideas related to European smart specialization. There is a very, uh, you know, different degrees of overlap uh, between uh, these uh, ideas and we had a chance to Explore so I expect that you know there will be uh, some discussions on that. Uh, also, we had a kind of um, uh, here the, the presentation which show all the complexity of the world. You know, uh, Michael's presentations showing uh, all the issues related in, into the region and problems, and then you try to relate it to kind of these policy models. And it is really you are kind of faced with this complexity. You know, oh my God, you know, idea cannot be directly translated into the world. At the same time you know that ideas do rule the world, or do they rule the world? We, we know what, what is the power of ideas. And the issue is whether the ideas which are floating now as alternative in terms of policy, are they making premature ideas? You know, are they ideas in a kind of in the process? Of course, I would like to wake up in 10 years time and tell you immediately what is the answer, but we don't know. It's the fundamental uncertainty, and we are those which are also, kind of also shaping uh, these ideas and, and the question whether we are in pre-paradigmatic stage or, or some new paradigms is emerging is, a, is an uh, open issue. At the same time, we could see through the presentations today, uh, uh, beside the ideas, which are kind of like uh, idealized models, uh, we kind of can, can argue about these models, but there is this uh, complexity of the world of policy process and institutional context where sometimes you cannot recognize many of the issues which, which uh, are you know, originally uh, motivate the whole process. There is this uh, enormous complexity uh, of the situation and our colleagues, uh, um, which are in public administration, they rightly pointed to this, uh, you know, uh, policy capacities and the policy context in which this kind of ideal model should operate. And, and that gives you a bit of, you know, modesty and, and understand what are the limits of all models and, and ideas. It doesn't mean, however, that models are not necessary. They are basically, without them, we cannot uh, um, operate. Uh, also, what I feel that there was a kind of issue which comes in the discussion is this variety of countries in terms of levels of development and, and a very much tendency to bundle it together. At the same time, we are full of understanding that basically uh, policy should be adjusted in dependence of 
country's level of development or what I would prefer in kind of neo-Schumpeterian terms, independence of a country which is distance to technology frontier. And in that uh, case, one can maybe argue that there is no one workable policy model, maybe it's a kind of variety of, of policy model, maybe this is a kind of much more pragmatic world where, where we are in the wrong uh, stage if we are chasing grand ideas. You know, it's, it's this idea of uh, economics like dentistry, you know, you, you try to fix the problems and you don't worry about the grand design. Or maybe in that case we can basically seg uh, segment the problem and telling all countries at the frontier, they've got their kind of problems which are qualitatively different, and, and the things which are uh, burdening low-income countries, maybe partly middle-income countries, are issues which are related to new structural economics, uh, and all ideas how their growth is dependent on the growth of other countries. Maybe there are countries in the middle where some ideas of smart specialization are, are, are relevant. So I'm just offering that as a way to, uh, uh, to, to, to hear your views and, and, uh, and discussion. So uh, we have definitely, uh, in, in the period where the structural reform and business environment uh, are not the only issues on the agenda, on the table. They are kind of still in, important and they continue to be uh, important. And of course, we can ask ourselves how much there is this mileage there. Uh, but uh, definitely there is something else emerging on the table. That doesn't mean that you will kind of uh, displace it and that you will, as, as uh, we, I think, concluded based on today that the business environment is important, but the issue where it, this is the only uh, thing. And that leads me to uh, Eric Berglov's little point in his presentation. We are all structuralists now. <laughs> well, that's a great, but does it mean that we are now in some another terrain, or maybe there's a kind of, again, you know, several ideas can coexist in a world that's a kind of Giovanni Dos is uh, uh, saying in economics theory only die without professors. Basically, they do coexist, and sometimes they even contradictory and they comfortably exist. You know? So maybe you know the, 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 we, we are in that kind of um, uh, point. My final point, which I want to say, is that uh, very often these things uh, are actually not uh, substitutes. I want to give you an example from my own kind of um, policy work, which is the, well, I'm not able now to show you that for some reason here. Um, I will have to tell you, I don't know why this doesn't show on this type of, uh, because it's another program in, in, in the iPad, okay. <laughs> but is, is the issue, I wanted to show you an example on, on, on Ukraine because uh, a nice matrix which uh, shows basically that the uh, policy focus is very often on the structural reforms which have this horizontal uh, character and in terms of uh, whatever is alternative, these are kind of horizontal policies. All EU machinery the last 20 years was in this kind of horizontal policies. Does it, where, I did, where I see the complementarity, I see the complementarity that many kind of uh, business environment issues, governance issues, they're also very much sector specific. Actually, I'm referring to Natalia's uh, presentation which showed us the general obstacles to business environment. But she could have all equally done the work on the uh, sectoral specific governance regime. And she would come with loads of obstacles uh, which prevent companies to uh, reduce their cost and, yeah, so, oh, that was the problem, yes, yeah. So, um, she could show a variety of, of things in this quadrant here, where you have a sector-specific privatization rules, sector-specific price subsidies, sector-specific regimes of licenses, sector-specific local content requirements, there's a whole thing, even when you look at the studies on McKinsey on Russia, they would argue that the major obstacles to increase the productivity are here, not in the generic, in the kind of, uh, general uh, business environment. And if you think that this is a, a part of it, then actually uh, if you want to do something on industrial upgrading, you cannot just focus on, on, the, on the kind of uh, uh, sectors in terms of its technology, in terms of smart specialization, but you also have to look at the specific sector of regulatory regime. And in that context, you know, they are not substitutes. I'm, come, I'm telling that because uh, it's in, I'm, when I was working on this in Ukraine then, uh, you talk to high-level Ukrainian policymakers, and you tell them, well, are you doing anything on industrial library? Oh, no, 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 this is not our priority. Our priority is first to do structural reforms. And then you tell them, yeah, but in your sectors, you have so many specific uh, you know, structural reforms problems. Are you addressing them? And if you are doing them, you know, how are you prioritizing? Which of the 500 that, that uh, Justin mentioned these reforms in uh, which country was it? Uh, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. <laughs> which are those first that you will do? And in that case, you cannot avoid the choice. But the choice is not kind of, oh, I'm putting some great, you know, R&D on it, but I'm trying to combine and couple my structural reforms uh, issues in specific sectors with, with, with some issues which uh, leads towards the industrial library. So 
I will uh, stop here because I think it is enough uh, from me to, to kick start the discussion. I give floor now to uh, Justin, who will also, I said, say his final or introductory word, however you want to, to frame it. And uh, I hope this will work now. Oh, no, I have to take out this maybe. Oh, it's here. Well, I think that in these two days discussions, you know, we all agree structural changes, no matter its economic development or its economic transition, government has some role to play. And yesterday I explained that in terms of transition, maybe a very pragmatic dual check approach would be useful. And in terms of economic development, from the new structural economic point of view, the government can play a facilitation role. But the question, the debate here is that, how can the government play that function well? And I'd like to use this opportunity to summarize some of my ideas about how to make the government policy well. You know, <clears throat> we say that government need to play some facilitation role for two reasons. You need to compensate for externality. And then you need to coordinate many different improvements. And those kind of improvements may not be possible to be internalized by the private firm. For example, the improvement of infrastructure, the improvement of human capital, or the improvement of some institutions. And industrial policy, theoretically, can be a useful tool. The main reason is that the content of coordination may be different. Depends on what kind of sectors you want to develop. If you want to develop agriculture, then irrigation will be very important. If you want to develop cut flower, then the cooling facility near the airport will be very important. But if you want to develop some kind of government industries, then the port facility will be very important. So the contents may be different. And that's just an example. And if the government resources is unlimited, and the capacity is unlimited, it's very easy. You provide everything for every industry. However, the government resources is limited. So the government needs to use the resources strategically, allocate them. And as they, I use one example, even in the basic research, you also need to allocate your resources in the basic research in order that kind of basic research can contribute to the applied research and commercial research. So I think that as long as resources are limited, no matter you like or not, it's the life. You need to allocate. Since you need to allocate, we need to develop certain kind of criteria to improve the efficiency of the allocation. Right? And in terms of policy, if you do well, you can make this kind of resource allocation together with the industry which are most likely to contribute to your structural changes, your competitiveness. But the sad fact, the reason why most people don't want the government to play the role is because, empirically, most industrial policy fail. And that is the reason why people say it's better not to get the government involved. However, my argument is that you should not throw the baby out together with the bus water, right? Because without government facilitation, then this kind of structural changes may not happen spontaneously. And so we need to understand how come most industrial policy fail. And as I argue, it's because of, very often, two types of error. For the developing country, very often, they are too ambitious. Try to go to the sector which go against their competitive advantages because they are too capital intensive. And for the developed country, 
Sometimes they want to predict sunset in between for the political reason, for the employment reason. But no matter what type of mistakes, they all win against their competitive advantages. Surely those kind of sectors are not viable, and uh, so you need to have all kinds of safety and protection, and then all the argument against the uh, uh, against industrial policy will come in. Political capture and, uh, and all the kind of reason we know. And uh, for the industrial policy to be successful, I think it's very important to target the industries, which I call they have latent competitive advantages. What do I mean by latent competitive advantages? Competitive advantages is determined by endowment structure, right? And if this sector is consistent with your competitive advantages, then the effective cost of production should be at the lowest level international, domestically and international. So if you only look at the factor of cost of production, they are very competitive. But just like Natalia mentioned yesterday, in the competition is total cost. And the total cost including the transaction cost. And transaction cost are very much depend on whether you have good infrastructure, or whether your institution is right, whether you have cluster or not. Those related to the transaction cost. And I think the industrial policy should target the government role is to reduce the transaction cost. And so the total cost of production can be competitive internationally. And the government need to identify those kind of factors, those kind of barriers that increase the transaction cost and help the firm to remove those kind of transaction costs. But the problem comes. If it's latent compared advantages, that means those kind of sectors may not be there yet. Those kind of sectors may not be competitive internationally yet. And how, the, how can the government know that kind of sectors as long as the government help to remove the transaction cost barrier will become competitive immediately. Some may not even be there. So how to do that? Can we learn from the history? As you know, Andrew mentioned, Andrew mentioned yesterday, if you look historically, all the successful countries, they all have, they all had industrial policies to help their industrial world. And if you look historically to the successful country, there's one thing in common. In general, when they try to support the industrial upgrading and catching up and so on, they are targeting industry in country which is not too far away from them. And that's starting from 15th century, 16th century, when the Britain wanted to catch up Netherlands in the war textile industry. And at that time, the Britain's per capita income was already 70% of Netherlands' per capita income. And then the United States century, you know, when the US, Germany, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, France wanted to catch up the Britain, and their per capita income was already 60% to 75% of US per capita income. And uh, then you going down to the modern time, you know, when Japan wanted to catch up the US, in the post-war period, the per income in Japan was already 40% of US per income. And when the small dragons in East Asia wanted to catch up Japan, their per income was about 30% of Japan's per capita income. But if you look into the failure cases, in general, they are targeting industry in country far advanced than. Their per capita income was less than 20%, sometimes even 5% or even less. And so the gap become very large. So from this, you know, we can we can learn some kind of lesson that you should target country which you're not too far away from you. And especially you should target the successful dynamic growing country and their per capita income is not too far away from you. And the reason why you wanted to target a successful country. If a country can grow dynamically in the past 20, 30 years, that means what? Almost all the industries in that country should be consistent with their competitive advantages. Without that, they cannot grow in dynamically for several decades, right? That's one thing. And the second, if they are growing dynamically for the past 20, 30 years, their wage rate must be increased very quickly. Their capital accumulation must be very quickly. So 
the set, the loss carrying industry used to be consistent with their kind of quantity, now will become a sunset industry. And if your state, your development is not too far away, their sunset industry will be your sunrise industry. So that's the way that we identify the latent competitive advantage. Because fundamentally, competitive advantage always means comparison, right? Compare yourself with the past, compare yourself with the other country. That's the idea of competitive advantage, right? So that is the secret of success. Now we can come into the existing tools for forming the development policy. The most popular one is based on Washington Consensus calling the doing business, uh, 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 those, kind of, those kind of approach. And that idea is based on Washington Consensus in group in institutions. And this approach has three drawbacks. The first one, just like the story of Burkina Faso, sometimes you, know, you need to improve too many things simultaneously. That's one drawback. And the government capacity is limited. The second drawback is that first best institution in high income country is not necessarily the first best institution in the developing country. But Washington consensus basically based on the institution in high income country. Wanted the developing country to adopt the same institution as in high income country. To give one example, in general, they recommend to develop equity market and big banks and venture capital. In a developing country, with a per capita income of less than 1,000, with a population size of less than 10 million, and to develop the same financial institution as in the US, certainly 90% of production activity in those kind of country was in small agriculture household, was small and medium size in the manufacturing sector and so on. And those kind of financial institutions won't be able to provide whatsoever financial service to the real sector at all, except for a few elites. And the third one is that the Washington consensus type of reform would not you know, permit or encourage the government to play the facilitation of what industrial gradient, overcome externality and, uh, uh, and a coordination issue, and those kind of issues are affect uh, a sector specific. And Washington consensus in general go against those kind of approach. Then you had a gross diagnostics of, of, of the general logic. And I think gross diagnostic is one step forward. You say, well, among those 500 items of reform, maybe one or two are relevant. And you only need to find all those kind of mining constraints. But the, 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 the drawback of this approach is that first one, it relies on the surveys of the existing firms. But the existing firm may be a result of the wrong policy in the past, right? And, and, and under that kind of situation, even you try to remove the money country for them, but they are in the wrong sector. Now, that is one drawback. And the second drawback is that industrial upgrading structural changes means you need to go to new sectors, right? But this approach would not be able to find what are the money country for the new sectors. And the third one, you know, Daniel Rossi is you have a little bit influenced by the Washington consensus. You go against sector specific policy. And sometimes, as I mentioned, sector specific policy is necessary for coordination and for compensation for externality. Then we have the product space. By regard to Hossam, it's another step forward. Regard to Hossam, and say, well, in the real world, the production is not only depends on the factories, mm -hmm. it also depends on some kind of toxic knowledge. And he said that toxic knowledge is very important. So you need to go to the sectors which you already can use your toxic knowledge for production. That means that they are not too far away from your product space. Okay, then this also has some limitation. The limitation is that some industry should not be there, right? As I mentioned, they may be the result of the past the wrong policy. For example, Uzbekistan. Today, their per capita income is 1,500. But they're exporting car to Russia. How come they can export in car to Russia? They heavily subsidize their sectors. And under this kind of situation, you invest on the product space. Uzbekistan, 75% of export is car to Russia. Should they go to tractor? Certainly not. That's one limitation. And the second limitation is that Again, it depends on the survey of the existing firm. But structural change always means you need to go to a new sector, right? 
and the product space will not be able to solve the issue. The neither that I control trial, I don't think it's even a you know, development policy. It's a humanitarian policy, but it's not development policy. Okay. Then based on that, I come up with an approach called growth identification and facilitation. And the first step is to look into countries which are not too far away from you. They are growing dynamically in the past 20, 30 years, and to look what are the tradable sectors in those kind of countries. And uh, those kind of tradable sectors are likely to be your sunrise industry, your legend compared to one this, this approach is very important because it can help the government to avoid being too ambitious, like in the past. And it can also help the government not to be captured by the private sector. Sometimes in a developing country, the private sector will you know, come to the government to say, well, this sector is very important for our future, but you need to give us a lot of protection. And, it's to, and it become a political capture. So this approach can help the government avoid that kind of too dangerous. Then, after that, you can come back home to see whether you have already private discovery. If you have private discovery, that means that you already have certain kind of passive knowledge there. Then the government should analyze how can your factor cost should be lower, because your waste rate is much lower. But how come you cannot compete with your competitors' countries? And in general, it is because of the transaction cost is much higher. <coughs> then the government can help to analyze what are the factors causing you to have a much higher transaction cost than your competitor country and help to remove that. And this approach has some advantages. It can incorporate the idea of past knowledge because it's a consultation with the government, between the government and the existing firm. And the existing firm must have some kind of past knowledge there. Then the third step, if this sector is totally new to you, then why not invite those firms to, in your competitor country to relocate them to your country? Because as I said, those are the sunset industry in your competitor countries. They must have some incentive to relocate to country which is not too far away in terms of their state of development and uh, the effective cost of production, especially wage rate is much lower. And this approach has some advantages. That means that past knowledge, in effect, can be imported as long as you have firm direct investment to come, they will bring the past knowledge to come together. So it doesn't have to be a binding contract. You can import that. And the first step is that technology changes very fast in a modern time. So, you know, 20 years ago, certain kind of industry, certain kind of business may not be there yet. And so your competitor country may not have those kind of industries. But if you have some kind of private discovery domestically, they already show certain kind of profitability there. Under this, the government should also help those kind of private sectors to remove the money content in order to scale. And one good example was India in the 1980s. Some private entrepreneurs identified the information service as one potential. At the beginning, they regard on satellite transmission. So it was very expensive but they already showed the profitability. So the government had to improve their base of telecommunication and dramatically reduce their information cost. And so now they become the leading sector in India and also in the world. So that's the fourth step. That uh, you know, private recovery because a new technology and a new opportunity. And the fifth step that in a developing country, in general, hard infrastructure and uh, soft infrastructure are poor. If the government ability is unlimited, you should improve that for the whole nation. And that is the idea in the Washington Consensus. However, as I mentioned, the government ability is limited. Resources are limited. So under that kind of situation, you can have a very pragmatic approach to set up certain kind of industrial park or spatial economic zone. Within a park or, or, or zones, you make a hard infrastructure good, business environment good and as a way to encourage foreign direct investment or private sector investment domestic. And this also has one eighteen advantage. It can encourage the formation of the cluster quicker. 
And this is one of the reasons why yesterday, yesterday I mentioned. If you go to China, Vietnam, Indonesia, their business environment in general is very poor. China 90, Vietnam 110, Indonesia 127, India 130, 30, 32. But they were so dynamic because within the industrial part, they make infrastructure good. They make a business environment very simple. And the uh, overall environment is still poor. And, uh, and, and the business environment surveys, survey on the overall environment. It's not survey on the industrial parks. But you can have this kind of pragmatic approach to address this issue. And the last one. So let's play the coordination role in a pragmatic way. The last step, the government need to compensate the first mover for the externality. And here that you can give some kind of very small incentive, for example, tax holidays for a few years, or some kind of priority access to the credit or foreign changes if they have those kind of control regulation. And that will be enough, because fundamentally, the sector you want to develop should be consistent with your competitive advantages. Firms should be viable. So your incentive is for overcoming externality. Unlike in the past, in the past, the subsidies or the incentive are for overcoming the viabilities. And for the viability, you need to be a large amount of fund and unlimited time. But for the externality, it should be one time or short period of time, and some amount will be enough. So basically, that is the approach I propose in the new structural economics. It's a very pragmatic way to address the issue of how to play the facilitation role in the process of structural transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> do we have uh, Daniel Leano as the next contributor? Uh, yeah, yes. Please. Uh, I think listen to uh, Justin for a second time uh, giving us you know, a very short time can you speak louder? A rehearsal, a rehearsal of what it takes to formulate and implement uh, a relatively successful development policy. Looks like something quite simple. <laughs> because it, it, it sounds very common sense. One has to figure out what the, the endowment of a country is. And, and then, <laughs> just allocate resources properly. I'll get back to the agenda, because I think that what I found missing in the presentation is that, in my view, this crisis, but also not only the financial crisis, has hit us, has awakened us, uh, has put us on a different plateau. And we are going through a period of several bifurcations what some people call the new normalcy. How can we cope with the new normalcy? I'll, I'll get back to it, but just um, let me mention a few of the lessons. If we get back, and I'm one of those who attended big debates on transition economics, I, I had my stints as a policymaker, um, and I can tell you. But but I think that after more than 20 years, uh, a strong vindication of those who said, look guys, we have underestimated the magnitude of the, of the required st structure change demanded by transition. And this is something which is quite clear in Justin's, in Justin's writings. And I remember, I, I, I wrote a piece on what causes arrears in transition economies. The IMF mantra at the time was that arrears are just the outcome of the inability of policymakers to impose hard budget constraints. If you remember Janusz Kornak's subject versus hard budget constraints. And, and I, I wrote a piece of study for the IMF and I said, look, it's not so simple. Arrears are also a structure response of an economy that is very uh, powerfully shocked, hit by 
by um, what's happening by a black swan going from uh, a regime of prices to another regime of prices, the market prices. And, and I'm probably I'm using the wrong metaphor, but if you think about quantitative easing and uh, the intervention of central banks and governments nowadays to help the financial sector stay afloat and not to prevent the total uh, meltdown of the system. I think one can use this analogy. At the time, people underestimated the magnitude of, of, of change uh, in, in, those, uh, in those economies. I, I'll, I'll go very quickly. I, I think that institutional change was also underestimated. Um, many of us believe that institution, institution will just pop up by, by freeing prices and, and liberalizing our economies. Um, and uh, where I find justice um, in a way one-sided approach when talking about transition economics and what could have been done better. I think that um, in Central and Eastern Europe, the, the quest for political liberties, for freedom, was so huge in most of the countries that opening was a must. Opening with its pluses and minuses when it comes to undertaking a more carefully devised transition. I'll stop on this note, because I don't want to deal with all this. This is history. Uh, there are so many books and, and studies on, on transition economics. Where I think uh, the IFIs made a blunder, and it's, and it's commendable that the IMF colleagues uh, acknowledged later is financial liberalization. Because not only Olivier Blanchard, but other people in, in, in this IDMF, they acknowledge that financial liberalization should have been much more uh, gradual, in tune with the capacity of an economy uh, to deal with, with, with shocks. The EBRD the the also acknowledged this. And, and I, I think the EBRD was also uh, much in tune with um, Joe Stiglitz and, 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 and his writings when he was at the helm of the, center, of, of, of the World Bank, when you emphasized the role of institutional change, that it's not so easy to create institutions. But let me get back to the agenda. I think it's a different world, Justin. In a way, what you have presented, it extrapolates the experience of the tigers, the Asian tigers, probably of Ireland. You go quite deep into history. And you say, it's an open vista for whoever wants in this world to catch up. I think it's much more complicated nowadays. And let me just, what's the new normalcy in the global environment? In, in my view, the cost of credit will be much higher in the years to come. You may say, look, but it's, it's going to be a fragmented world. The cost of credit will be much lower in Asia than in Europe. We may have three subgroups in the international financial system. I don't know, but in my view, the cost of credit will be much higher. It's the great moderation um, will no longer come back. It's finished. Um, so this is what's, um, this is a fundamental, a fundamental change. Secondly, what can we do in Europe? I'm not talking about Asia or Latin America. In Europe, if we think about Central and Eastern Europe, but also other emerging economies, we are very much in the proximity of an area which is going through very painful moments, which are 
not likely to come to an end soon. And even if they are coming to an end soon, uh, what's looming at the horizon is quasi economic stagnation. So being in the geographic proximity of a big area that's not going to grow, to be dependent for three quarters, two thirds of your exports on that area. You can imagine. Because you can just not, you cannot reallocate resources so easily. It's like <laughs> trying to re reallocate resources in an economy to produce the right um, uh, structure of output, whereas now it would be like reallocating uh, trade, diverting trade towards areas that are um, of much higher growth. Um, what do you do in economies where the local banking sectors are controlled so heavily by foreign groups, which are going to be absorbed for a long period of time by what? By the leverage. And this economy, I, I'm, I'm focusing on, on, on Europe. I'm not focusing on, on other emerging economies. Because this seminar is devoted mainly European transition, European economies, not to emerging economies. Capital markets are very feeble in this in Europe, as again the United States. So, so what's going to happen? I mean, so this is why I'm I have this conundrum, I have these dilemmas, because the way you present it is fine until the eruption of the crisis. I think this crisis is an awakening call. It has brought us back with our feet on the ground in many, many respects. Um, so how can we, clearly we have to devote more, we have to reorient investment towards trade. It's not easy to do it. And let me tell you, and, I, and I'm going to be quite open, this is what I, I'm telling colleagues of mine in the commission. So. There is a logic of the single market which says, don't care about comparative advantages. They will reveal themselves just by the function of the market. Just create a level playing field, a friendly business environment, very low transaction cost, just capital is going to flow into your economy. And that's the end of the story. Forget about other things. Now, what have we seen in Europe among transition economies? Something which Michael has presented in several papers, working papers in Vienna, but also our uh, Bruegel report. Bruegel was quite diplomatic the way it put its conclusions. And remember why. Because I was, I, and I, I'll tell you here. I was much more forceful. I think financial integration has failed to a large extent in Europe for a very simple reason. Because it doesn't make sense to have financial integration, deep financial integration, without a proper design of the Eurozone, without a proper design of the institutions and the policy arrangements. In the end, uh, we ended up We what? Now we have a dynamic of fragmentation, a banking crisis, uh, burdening, a burdening of the public budgets, and the inability to break the umbilical cord between bank balance sheets and I don't want to get into detail, but, but it's a mess. This is the reality, it's a mess. And even if in, in among, among our economies we have more policy space, and I'm referring to the economies which are not members of the Eurozone, because there is something which I believe is much underestimated in the public debate in Europe. And I, I may sound presumptuous, but I want to say it. Macroeconomists are very fond of saying there is need for fiscal space. And we know there is need for fiscal space. The IMF people are saying it, the World Bank people are saying it, the Abidna and our friends in the reality, there is need for fiscal space. But there is need for something much more. 
and this is also less of the crisis, policy space. Because what we have discovered, not only because of the economic crisis, but because of the black swans, tail events, we need economies and societies that should be robust and resilient. Nobody can be sufficiently robust and resilient, but at least we should have policy flexibility and policy space. When one is in doubt only with monetary, with, <laughs> with fiscal policy, then it's a very tall order. It's very tough to target so many objectives by using only fiscal policy. So, at least on paper, it should be much easier for economies which can rely on monetary policy, on their own exchange rate policy, on fiscal policy. That is true wherever euroization is high, then that's a blessing in disguise. But I think policy space is fundamental. Industrial policy is a component of, of, of the policy space. All governments are trying to use more internal reserves, efficiency reserves. And there are reserves. Some countries have enormous efficiency reserves. You talk about Russia. Not only natural resources, but efficiency reserves, because Russia is extremely inefficient. But transition economies are quite inefficient. It's not easy, however, to mobilize internal reserves because it demands, again, clever mandarins, clever bureaucrats. And the big question is, if they had such reserves before, why? You know what I'm trying to say. It's not easy. But it's something I believe Americans have tried to do it uh, in Europe. <coughs> We are trying to do it. And in Asia, countries will, will, will be forced to do it. Now, uh, only, only, only to the second the final points, yeah. Now, I do not believe that we're going to have a new industrial revolution, because in Europe there is this mantra now, a new industrial revolution, uh, <laughs> Europe 2020. <laughs> I don't think an industrial revolution is the exit. For a very simple reason. If there's going to be an industrial revolution, Asian economies can also benefit on such an industrial revolution. Okay. And last but not least, I believe it's more linked with social dynamics. Uh, even countries which are liable to grow and will continue to grow for years to come will not fend off uh, social unrest unless the issue of fairness, which should not be defined only in terms of income distribution. Fairness means much more. It refers also to fair play, to the rule of law, to how people are respected, whether the dignity of people is respected. And, and this is what we see. We see it in Turkey. We see it in Brazil. Countries which are growing by, have been growing by four, five, six, seven, eight percent. The issue of fairness, I think, is underestimated. And the issue of fairness is very, very uh, saliently becoming prominent because the new information and communication technologies are empowering people. Very poor people can get a voice. Here's my, here's the. Voice. Voice is a very powerful concept. And how governments are going to respond to it, I don't have an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, Michael? Well, I don't want to use much time. Uh, so, um, well, I think it was a very inspiring conference, I <laughs> think, to start off. And uh, to narrow it down, I think uh, probably the main impulse which I would like to take with me is uh, to work out the proper industrial policy for Europe. <laughs> um, and uh, because there are so many issues yeah, <laughs> to discuss. Uh, so I, I will uh, just ask a few questions from Lynn because obviously this was, you have a very consistent uh, framework, obviously very well based and so on. But I do also see some uh, gaps in how to translate it into the European scene. Yeah? <laughs> 
Um, well, one gap was uh, a wider context, which I think Daniel was already pointing out. Uh, Europe suffers from industrial policy problems, but also from macro <laughs> policy problems, which are virulent. Yeah? And this is a basic setting in which also, especially Europe's periphery, uh, low middle income countries are suffering from the macro policy setting constraints, which includes, and that, of course, will spill over into uh, any resources which you uh, might be able to use on industrial policy. So I think uh, I would have expanded more if there was time on the macro versus industrial, but uh, I think we have to consider that, uh, that context. The second one, of course, is uh, the way you present it is um, really in the context of when the uh, when we're speaking about national policy making, yeah? <laughs> and of course we have an interesting experiment in, 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 in Europe, which is policies conducted at different levels, yeah? So how to um, translate the concept of industrial policy to these different levels is something one has to resolve. It's a matter of delegation uh, on what is to be conducted on which level. It might even be a much more, you might come to more optimal solutions because of these different levels. Uh, like uh, when you speak about the coordination function here, yeah? this almost uh, shouts for <laughs> uh, conduct of uh, such policies at different levels, and probably Europe has an extremely uh, favorable setting being able to delegate the appropriate coordination function to different levels. But I think one uh, thinks one has to think that through quite carefully how this is uh, to be done. So I think this uh, multi-level policy making setting is. Uh, something important and we have to think quite carefully how to uh, deal with that. The th third point was, uh, I think Alistair mentioned this uh, regional innovation di dilemma, which I think is a hugely important issue. I, I guess it's also an important issue within a big country like China, yeah, where they said the problem of uh, the regional dilemma is uh, that uh, the regions or localities which need the most sophisticated <laughs> Policy making frameworks to co because they have the biggest needs are basically uh, er that uh, capacity is eroding and quality is uh, eroding. Um, and I think we very much find that situation uh, in, in Europe. I didn't hear much uh, suggestions how to get out of that, yeah? <laughs> the regional. And it's actually not only an innovation dilemma, it's a, a dilemma in all spheres of poli policy yeah? making. And I would like, and I think this is a vital um, issue for Europe, especially because we see that this issue of uh, regional non-convergence, uh, which I think is, uh, again, uh, much more accentuated now than it was uh, uh, before the crisis, uh, how to deal with that. Uh, the fourth point, which is, again, a question uh, to you a bit, uh, and somewhat linked, um, well, you say uh, one should always be quite close to one's latent comparative advantages, yeah? But of course, each country, uh, uh, countries mass certain resources and certain endowments regionally in a very differentiated way across space, yeah? So for example, when you speak about <coughs> India, what is the natural endowment structure which you cannot define for the country as a whole because you might have uh, Bombay and Bangalore which looks like some of the most advanced yeah, in London structures. And I think uh, in that sense, you might also get quite a few distortions as a result of this uh, very strong regional concentration uh, of endowments or differentiation of endowments across uh, regional space, which from a national point of view might be suboptimal, but uh, the evolution of uh, economic structures uh, uh, sort of uh, clicks in uh, or uh, it attaches itself to these regional uh, endowment structures. Uh, the last or one before last point is, um, well, I don't think we made too much headway with the politics. <laughs> um, I uh, thought in our session uh, we would get more material on that. Um, uh, well, I think, uh, we seem to be able to be more uh, describing what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes very bad experiences, uh, sometimes very good experiences. Yeah, but I, I'm missing a little approach to, which could guide us uh, how uh, the malfunctioning in, uh, like in real existing socialism, we have real existing EU political sphere, 
how uh, we can design uh, or think about what drives uh, effective and non-effective governance at the regional level, at the national level, etc. So um, I would have thought uh, much stronger political science input uh, uh, would be needed. Because we, before we do that, uh, we can't really make suggestions from a normative point of view uh, to uh, carry out much stronger interventionist policies if we haven't solidified our uh, analysis. Uh, what Will it work in the real political context or not? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Could I invite now Peter Sante from Well, thank you, Slavo. Um, I'll try to be very brief. May I? say firstly that uh, although I haven't attended the whole conference, uh, what I have attended has been uh, extremely interesting and informative to me and, and uh, Justin, I didn't hear you speak yesterday but uh, I'm so glad that I heard you speak now because this was really a brilliant overview of what new structural economics uh, is, is about. I was floundering a little bit yesterday, I have to admit, because I didn't quite understand what it was about but now I feel I, I, I do have a, an understanding. Um, the question then arises, and coming from the EBRD, um, I guess it was the, the basic framework of the whole Twitter. workshop, how does new structural econ economics differ from transition economics? I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer uh, to that yet. Let, let me say um, a little bit about how, firstly, how our thinking at the EBRD has evolved, and I guess um, uh, the only advantage of my being here rather than Eric is that I have been at the EBRD longer than uh, he has um, been there nearly 16 years. And so I joined the EBRD when it was still a very young, dynamic institution. Now it's a bit more of a mature institution, but still dynamic, I think, and still uh, able and willing to uh, change, perhaps more so than some other uh, uh, IFIs. And I think, uh, if I think about the last 15, 16 years, how, how has our thinking evolved? I think uh, there are three broad ways. And one is um, on the whole role of institutions. So when I joined in 1997, I think we, we didn't really appreciate the understanding, we didn't really appreciate the role of institutions in driving the, the transition and explaining differences across countries. So we relied, relied a lot on rather um, crude countrywide transition indicators, uh, which um, were nice once we got a number of years, were nice for putting into regressions. Karsten, you referred to th this industry yesterday that both you and I and some others in the room were involved in, in terms of putting uh, transition indicators on the right hand side and trying to explain things. I don't think that literature was totally useless. Uh, but um, I think it has uh, reached a natural end. And what we have uh, increasingly over time moved towards is emphasizing uh, sectoral analysis of transition and, and looking not just at, at uh, the role of markets, but also the market supporting uh, institutions. So that's what we give a lot of emphasis to now in our uh, in transition board. Uh, the second way I think has evolved is to give much greater importance to surveys. So we have surveys of, of businesses, uh, our uh, BEEPS, Business Environment and Enterprise Performance Survey that we do jointly with the World Bank. Uh, we have surveys of individuals, so we have the Life and Transition Survey also jointly uh, with the World, World Bank. We have um, uh, a major banking survey that we're uh, about to launch, uh, the results of which are about to launch uh, very soon, the second round. Uh, and also some some others. So that uh, again, it's this voice that Daniel referred to is the voice of the of the businesses on the ground and the people on the ground, which uh, is increasingly important. And the third way that our thinking is evolving is on the uh, social dimension. So when I joined the EBRD 15 years ago, there was uh, really I would say only lip service paid to social indicators and and indeed the social implications of our uh, of our projects. Now we're much more <clears throat> much more aware of the importance of uh, social inequality, a lack of inclusion of certain groups in, in different uh, countries. I think it's been <coughs> given an impetus by our involvement now in, in, uh, in Northern Africa and in the Middle East where these inclusion problems are often particularly uh, severe. Now, uh, when it comes to <coughs> industrial policy, and I guess this is the crux of the matter, we. Uh, 
I do recall in uh, 2008, uh, I was actually the lead editor of our transition report that year, and it had a special theme of, of growth, and uh, we thought we'd better tackle this industrial policy issue head on, and we, uh, we had Simon Commander, well known to, to many of you here, who uh, uh, the colleague wrote a chapter on, on this. So it was a, an overview of the experience, and indeed it confirmed just what you said, that it's very hard to find good examples of industrial policy. We found uh, it was not difficult to find examples of, of failures, uh, including in the, in, the, uh, in the transition countries. So it, it, didn't, um, it didn't really encourage the EBRD, I think, to think more seriously about uh, industrial policy. I think, indeed, the, the phrase industrial policy is not often heard uh, within our uh, institutions. So should it be... Uh, should it be brought into EBRD discourse more than, than before? Well, <coughs> maybe, but um, my main concern uh, is the one that I think Daniel already mentioned, that who, who has the capacity in these countries to, to carry out this analytical exercise, which looks quite straightforward in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, and you, you presented it brilliantly, but who, who really has the capacity to do that? And are they, uh, are they professional, are they competent, and are they disinterested? And unfortunately, um, when we look across our countries, it's not something that we can say publicly, but, but the fact is that it's not just about the risk of governments and officials being captured. They, they already are captured in many countries. Um, uh, I'm thinking here of the... Uh, I'm sure a number of you read this uh, Ajamoglu and Robinson book, Why Nations Fail, and, and they refer in their final chapter to this ignorance hypothesis that's quite common in, in IFIs. The, the view that uh, the countries were trying to help in developing countries, transition countries, that they, they're, they're, uh, they're led by well-meaning, um, publicly spirited individuals who are, are perhaps just a bit ignorant of how to do the things, and so smart people from the IFIs come and show them, and then they they go and, and implement. And the reality, of course, is very different, that uh, very often the policy makers, uh, the heads of government and so on in these countries are extremely smart people who are entirely out for their own benefit and the small group around them, rather than the, uh, the good of the, of the country. So if that is the case, how can you, uh, how can you persuade these governments to take seriously uh, an industrial policy based on identifying latent comparative advantages and so on that will benefit groups other than their own small uh, Vested interests. Uh, if we look at the life and transition survey that I mentioned, uh, it, it's very striking in, in, in many of our countries the, the deep distrust of politicians, of, of parliament, of, of governments. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, of course, it's, it, there's a lot of distrust of these institutions, these people in, in Western countries, but it's, it's really at rock bottom in, in, in many of our uh, countries of operations. And then finally, when I look at the, uh, <coughs> our experience as an investor, and, and we, we uh, at the EBRD are primarily an investor in private sector operations, but we still have a lot of public sector projects and a lot of uh, what we call policy dialogue with countries in, in, in many countries. And, and the experience of our people on the ground, uh, I'm not a banker, but I talk to these people a lot in the countries I visit, is that uh, it's extremely difficult to implement big public sector projects. It re really requires day to day chipping away, banging away, banging your head against a, a, a wall sometimes to try and get uh, uh, implementation. And, and so, again, if that's the case, if the quality of the public administration is so poor as it really, frankly, is in many countries, can we really then talk seriously about developing the kind of industrial policy uh, ideas you, uh, you were referring to, Justin. Um, let, let me finish just a little trailer for our uh, transition report at 2013, uh, which, um, as usual, will be published in November, and, and I very much hope we had a very nice event here uh, last November uh, or December uh, around the last report, and I hope to, uh, that I or somebody will come and present it again. It, it, it will uh, focus it will have a very strong political economy theme. It has a tentative title uh, of uh, stuck in transition with a question mark, 
I'm not sure if that title will last to uh, publication, but uh, it is uh, going to try to make an attempt to explain why countries uh, don't move forward on reform, uh, why the political evolution has been so different across countries, and why the quality of institutions is different across countries too. And I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to draw some new lessons from this, which will be relevant both for our transition agenda and for the agenda of the new structural economics. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> but if I was to wrap up before giving the floor to the others, it's a kind of um, uh, generally sympathy of speakers, sympathetic towards the ideas of new structural economics. Uh, but then comes the obvious question, where are the mandarins? dangers of narrow vested interest government failures, which obviously you would expect it. Uh, Michael has then helped all series of issues how to translate that into the EU context. So there's something for you for consultancy work in the future to think there's a series of questions that you, you have to answer. Um, and, and Daniel then points, in, even in the new normal, that becomes even further away uh, and some of these uh, ideas because of the, again, we come back to the same issue, and uh, where are the mandarins? So that, that's kind of, for me, interim <laughs> wrapping up. But before giving floor to you, I think it would be great if we have a, a few more contributions for people that were either silent or, or maybe have a, a burning point, then we can allow three, four, five minutes uh, uh, so that we, we really have a, a bit of variety. Yes. Yeah. Um, just to add um, a, a further perspective to the contrast between the experience of the East Asian countries and the, the transition countries in Europe, um, you, you haven't mentioned at all in your presentation the fact that for the last 30 years or so, the East Asian countries have been investing something like 40 to 50 percent of GDP, and they've also been um, creating human capital on a scale which is probably close to being unprecedented in, in human history. Uh, and, and these levels of investment and, and human capital formation would be very difficult to replicate elsewhere, um, in part because the East Asian countries have been reaping the so-called demographic dividend. They've had a very high proportion of the population in the working age group, uh, particularly for China, it's expected that India is going to move into a similar demographic profile and reap that kind of dividend for the next 20 to 30 years. But China's coming to the end of that, and it will go from having a very favorable age structure to becoming the most rapidly aging country the world has ever known um, because of the one-child family policy. That, that's going to add to the slowdown in, in, in the world economy uh, growth. Um, but 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 the key factor, I think, is that the, 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 the kind of demographic aspect of um, the East Asian experience, uh, along with the difficulties of replicating the characteristics of the East Asian states, which was highlighted already in the 1993 uh, World Bank report on the East Asian miracle, that, that what's been achieved in East Asia would be very difficult to replicate in other parts of the world with very much less competent um, and, and weaker states. The, 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 that, those are grounds for further reinforcing the, the, the kind of pessimism about the transferability of, of, of the model that you've been advocating. That's not to deny that, that what you've produced is a very accurate and very illuminating synthesis of the East Asian experience and, and lessons from it and, and some lessons from Latin America Latin American structuralism and the Irish experience and so on. But whether this is sustainable and, and, and repeatable it, it, it is very strongly open to question. OK, so here we have um, a skeptic who say, or the counter view would be, uh, are academics the best people to ask about policy? Well, so just, and I just want one, that we should be skeptic. One <laughs> afterthought, that the, that the level of investment and human capital formation that's been achieved in East Asia is in part, I think, also due not just to the demographic dividend, the very favorable age structure, but also the extended family, which allows for considerable pooling of resources um, for investment, for creating new businesses, for educate. I mean, a lot of the Chinese students 
who are coming to study here. Are, are, it's not just their parents, but the whole family helping to, to, to fund the, their studies. That kind of pooling of resources would be very difficult to replicate in, in the much more individualistic um, European nuclear family uh, context. And, and, and that's another a, a further reason why I think it, 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 much as your model is, has a great deal to admire, it, it's just uh, too good to be true in terms of uh, it, its transferability and replicability uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Yeah? I just thought I would try to, to link a little bit of, of the macro and the sort of industrial policy developments the last 10 years. And I argue that we, we really need some kind of ideas for how to move people from less productive to more productive uses. We didn't really see it during the pre-crisis period, because what happened was that we were flooded with imports from China and uh, the Asian tigers, and it basically killed all low-tech industry in Europe. And the low-tech industry was situated in Portugal, the pajamas industry all collapsed, uh, so some extent in Italy and Spain, and, uh, and it held back the expected industrial uh, boom in, in, in Eastern Europe. But then we compensated by borrowing like crazy. Borrowing from China to uh, keep domestic uh, uh, parts of the economy going, the construction sector, the, the, uh, the, the government sector. So this was a government borrowing in Southern Europe. It was private borrowing in Eastern Europe. But the effect was the same. These, uh, basically, we took the low productive workers, which had previously produced clothes and stuff for so low tech, which now came from China, and moved them to the construction sector and into the uh, public sector. And the crisis sort of changed that altogether. Now all these people have been uh, 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 fired from construction sites, the public sector is cutting down, and they are now showing on, up in the unemployment statistics. And the, the, the sort of slightly scary scenario for the next 10 or 15 years is that this uh, flood of cheap imports from Asia will continue, meaning that we cannot really expect Portuguese workers to get back to the sewing machines and produce pajamas. Uh, right now, they're hanging around being unemployed. And somehow we need to find ideas to move them into something more productive because we cannot uh, expect the manufacturing sector to, at least not the sort of low-tech manufacturing sector to pick up anytime soon. Uh, so I see that the sort of this, the linkages, and we, we, we pasted over the problems uh, too long and now we, after the crisis, we, we, we certainly have them at our hands and also uh, looking forward, it seems like this issue will be there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back uh, to the uh, important component of this uh, unstructured economics um, uh, theory and this is comparative advantage and mainly this uh, that what is called the comparative advantage. I think uh, that most of uh, the main idea behind this at least so far as it is expressed in the theory, it's based on uh, classical and neoclassical trade theory. However, recent evidence, they show that it's not that simple and it's not that uh, clear how comparative advantage is defined. And I would uh, refer you to the paper by, uh, research uh, working paper by World Bank issued last year by Caroline Freud and uh, uh, author, which is called <coughs> Exporter Superstar, Export Superstars. It's, it's uh, really uh, very um, interesting because it uh, highlights uh, things that were not that obvious before. And, that is, uh, and the results are quite striking. The, the, the results based on the database, new database collected by World Bank from 32 uh, developing countries, there is no developed countries, on quite disaggregated at firm level uh, trade data, export, export data, not trade, but just export. And the results are quite uh, interesting. So, 1% of uh, firms, by number of firms, of exporting firms, they, they uh, trade 33% 30, 30, 30, uh, of export. One firm, on average, in each country exports 
15% of our overall export, excluding oil, uh, oil trade. So there is the trade, oil, uh, trade in oil excluded from the database. So if you uh, get from the data, from the data, if you get uh, data on 1% of foreign countries look similar in terms of export structure. So if you, uh, compa it means that comparative advantage is defined by 1% of firms on average in each country, developing country. If you get rid of them, countries look the same. You will not distinguish between countries. In general, if you look in the export structure, they're similar. It means that the, uh, this comparative advantage is defined by those 1% of firms. So how, uh, it's very interesting, important question, how they became superstars. This is what authors call superstar, this 1% of firms that define comparative advantage of individual countries. And um, there are not many store, uh, there were not many possibilities to track the dynamics of this firm, but in several cases it was possible and the results are also quite striking. Uh, those new, they call this new superstar that so we can follow, the, they appeared in the database recently and uh, could be tracked for several years. So they became exporters, being large firms, being big firms. They didn't learn from domestic production, and they mostly foreign owned. <coughs> so this is in line with what uh, Justin was uh, proposing, that look for the experience, but uh, look for uh, foreign investment to define the sectors, and don't base your industrial policy on your current country industrial profile. However, in the theory, it's not clear yet. Why is the uh, reason that just a few giant firms define comparative advantage, and why they, uh, this uh, distribution is so skewed? Because if we believe in a comparative advantage that is driven by factor endowment, what was also proposing, then uh, this kind of result cannot be supported. Why? Because uh, if it's comparative advantage, it means that country has some intrinsic features that define low relative cost of production in this particular country. But then each firm should enjoy these uh, conditions. Many firms should enjoy this country, but this is just a few. Then the question is, uh, why is it the case? And s s several possibilities uh, possible. One is that uh, in heterogeneous firms approach, there is a very, very small probability that firms get very high uh, productivity. And it means uh, the whole theory is probabilistic and no uh, trade po industrial policy which will aim for uh, uh, industries will uh, be successful. On the other hand, it might be a, ve might be a very uh, high return to scale in tradable sectors. So far, uh, mm -hmm. there is no, it's not clear, it's a research question. Uh, to test it, both hypotheses, what is the reason how these superstars evolve and how they, but th these results, I, I believe, very important. So, and they emphasize the importance of both uh, structural policies and industrial policies. Structural policies as defined major uh, prof overall profile of remaining exporters, not superstars, and superstars is something special, and they need to be uh, somehow uh, brought in the country, and the role of uh, international firms of uh, multinationals is very important in this respect. On other important aspect, I also support what was uh, said by Daniel, is uh, how you relocate. And here, all examples that Justin provides when he are when he is um, the most clear examples of China, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia. Very important thing that all those countries have organization uh, organization uh, array below world average. The question is, if there is quite low urban rate uh, population in cities, it means there is a huge a, a lot of possibilities to bring a lot of employment to new places, to new cities, to new uh, industries. Or if it's already people somehow employed, like in Russia, you have. 35% uh, uh, rate of urbanization and 4% uh, uh, unemployment rate, how you will bring up those uh, export superstars. So it's, uh, it means relocating people, it is always difficult, it's almost, sometimes almost impossible, so you need to have this kind of uh, 
uh, soft constraints in terms of labor resource, because labor here is essential. Investments, uh, foreign investments go to the places where you can find the sort of employment uh, in enough quantity with uh, some skills already available and so on. So this is quite important to remember that this kind of uh, approach is not suitable for all countries, especially for countries that already have quite substantial urban rate and uh, the, uh, they have low unemployment rate. And saying this, I, uh, it's uh, the good, uh, the important thing that this uh, theory uh, proposes, which I like a lot, that uh, orientation in, in uh, when, uh, when government defines, uh, if it follows this approach and defines priorities, that's priority industries, that it is not based upon the existing structure. That makes this, uh, it makes possible to um, define new priorities without the uh, lobbying uh, activity of existing industries that push government to make uh, decisions in their favor. So uh, this is very important and I uh, like it a lot. So if it will be possible to pursue Russian government, for example, <laughs> to follow this kind of approaches, it would be very beneficial because uh, many of problems, current problems, for example, they are driven by the fact that uh, the government cannot get rid of the past, it influences its decisions uh, for future. Okay, excellent. So there is hope for application okay. in Russia. Okay. <laughs> Are there more? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Very briefly, uh, I'm Chris Bowman, also at EBRD. I'm a banker. Peter has spoken very articulately, and I would endorse all his points. He talked about the way the EBRD had changed. One thing that has been consistent, which ties in with what Natalia has just said, is its support for foreign direct investment. And I just, I assume, having attended part of this but not all, that the, the new structural economics is integrated with the economics of foreign direct investment. Because in the old days, industrial policy was seen in a rather national way. I think our successes have, in all respects, been as a catalyst uh, to encourage foreign direct investment as a carrier of so much of this change. say something, but mm. you, you have bewildered me. Mm. Uh, uh, the demand for FDI, for attracting capital, is going to stay. Right? And, and it's, it's paramount. But as we see, what's been happening is that it's, it's a tremendous, there is a tremendous retrenchment. It's, it's close up. The flows are much lower in, 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 the, in the crisis years. And I may be wrong, but I believe that they're going to stay much lower in the years to come. Which means what, by implication? That there should be encouragement of domestic savings. It's not clear to me how this can be done. There should be more reliance on domestic drivers. Forget about them, it's only foreign capital can do it. In addition, there is a question of where foreign capital goes. Because there is a hell of a difference between, we have not talked about the, the, the existence of clusters of countries, of economies. We have economies which are much better integrated in the industrial core of Europe. And we are fortunate, I'm referring to the Czech Republic, to Slovakia, partially to Hungary, to Poland, and it's interesting because the fracture between the northern fringe of the Eurozone and the southern fringe of the Eurozone is replicated in Central and Eastern Europe. And this is because of foreign capital. Foreign capital has been flowing. I mean, it's, we can argue about it, but it's, it's a fact. So if there's not going to be a policy at the level of the EU, it's not clear to me how, because this is what uh, Michael has to emphasize this morning whether we can have EU-level policies in this regard, which should deal with the fractures, with the cleavages, whether we can complement EU-level policies with national policies. Q 
Can we have national policies in this regard? We should encourage domestic saving. We should shape the orientation of investment towards trade -off. So these are the kind of issues which are not addressed sufficiently by policymakers, whether in the Commission, whether at the national level, for various reasons. Thank you. Well, I will. Uh, of course, it's, it was the biggest carrier of uh, technology transfer, of upgrades and so on. But there are also two features which are pretty striking. One is the geographic concentration. You mentioned it by country, but it's also within a country by regions. And the other one, very mixed results on skill orders, yeah, on the development of others. So I think it looks, and the third one is, of course, which sectors will, will go, and uh, they were very much prone to um, uh, to support the credit-led uh, distortions, which we have seen in, in quite a few countries, yeah, in terms of sectoral allocation of FDI. So I think it, it still needs a guiding hand yeah, in terms of... Uh, directing or supporting certain conditions which allow some regional uh, spread yeah, of FDI, uh, encourage the spillover effects and the domestic supplier networks, and also to make sure that um, in countries which have uh, very problematic uh, macro developments in terms of really change rate developments, uh, credit boards and so on, that FDI uh, is not part of that game. Yeah? Thank you. Shall we allow now um, Justin to uh, tell us where do we find European mandarins <laughs> to dispel this kind of pessimism? Yeah, please. Uh, I think that as all those discussions are very good and uh, deserve further exploration. And I'd just like to give some very preliminary response from just hearing the comments. The first one regarding the global economic situation. We are still in a crisis, and very likely, the high-income country in Eurozone, in US, and in Japan, we're entering into a period of protracted new normal for those decades. And uh, that this make the agenda we are discussing here less relevant. I would say yes and no. In the years that are, you know, certainly the number one concern for the high income country currently is how to get out of this new norm. And uh, luckily, I just have one book published yesterday, on the day before yesterday, <laughs> trying to discuss this question. And uh, in my proposal to address the likely lost decades, then the industrial policy, the structural transformation will be part of the story. Because for the crisis hit country, we know that they need to have some kind of structural reform in order to go back to their competitiveness and get out of the crisis. But currently, in Eurozone, the difficulty is that the structural reform in general, mean in a short period of time, is constrictionary. Reduce wage rate, reduce welfare, and a cut government deficit. They will also reduce demand. And, uh, and the growth will slow down. Unemployment may further go up. Politically, it's feasible. In the past, there was one solution to devalue the currency, increase export, and uh, use that to create a space for the structural reform. But currently, in the Eurozone, you don't have that option. Euro certainly can devalue. However, you know, the European countries are at the same level of the development as Japan, as the US, your products are competing in the international markets. And so if the euro area wants to devalue as a way to create a space for the Southern European country, it will take up the US market, Japanese market, and you are going to achieve your competitive devaluation. And that's what we observe in the past month, past year, right? So under this kind of situation, how can we find a way out for the crisis hit high income country? And in my book, I propose global recovery initiative by a large initiative in bottleneck relation, productivity enhancing type of infrastructural investment. 
if we can have this kind of coordinate effort by making large enough infrastructure investment in a high income country as well as in the developing country, in the short run, it can create the demand and the space for the structural reform. And if those kind of projects will design, implemented, their productivity enhancing, in the future, the government revenue will be increased and it can pay back the investment now. So it's a win-win for now and for the future, and it will be a win-win for high-income country and developing country. And developing countries need to be in the equation because high-income country alone, you may not have, have large enough opportunity for those kind of bottleneck relation, productivity enhancing type of investment. So developing country should join force. But precondition for the developing country to make those kind of infrastructure investment self liquidation that means that they can generate high enough return after the project being completed to pay back the debt. The precondition is that you need to have a very dynamic economic growth. Because only you have dynamic economic growth, the intensity of the use of infrastructure will be high enough and to generate the return for the investment now. And that bring in the structural transformation we discussed. Only if in the developing country can have high enough growth rate, like East Asia, seven, eight, nine percent growth rate. If they can have those kind of growth rate, then infrastructure will be a bottleneck and the investment in infrastructure will generate high return. So I think that yes, you know, if we can think of this kind of very innovative way, then we can link the structural transformation with counter cyclical intervention together. And I call those kind of projects called beyond pensionism. And I promote that in my book. The first question. The second question related to the ability of the government to implement those kind of growth identification and falsification. And there are two issues raised. The first one, how do you know the similarity in the endowment structure? Okay, and my response actually is not so hard. If the industry is resources intensive, agriculture or mineral, and certainly you need to look into the in natural environments because agriculture depends on certain kind of soil quality or weather and you need to find those kind of you know, natural endowment. And those kind of natural endowment is not so hard to identify. Like Chile, you know, because they are close to the ocean and they know salmon can be an opportunity. And so they look into other countries with salmon farming and they learn the technology from them. Okay, that's related to product, which is resources intensive, natural resources intensive, no matter it's in mineral or in agriculture. But then in the manufacturing sectors, in the manufacturing sector, most important factor of production is capital and labor. And so you want to find country that with similar capital and labor ratios and income level is a very good proxy for the capital level availability. So you only need to look at country which their per capita income is about 100%, 200%, higher than yours. Then their capital level ratio will be around the range, you know, 100% higher, 200% higher. So in that regard, endowment is not so hard to identify if you really think carefully about the nature of production. Then the ability. If endowment is not so hard to identify, do we have the ability to implement those type of facilitation I'm advocating? And I'm quite confident. They all have the ability. So they already prove they have the ability. And uh, really, and then, where is the for? When you look in Russia, you have implemented, you can have a space shuttle. They must have those kind of institutional capacity. And what I'm arguing is much simpler than that. Then, whether they have an incentive or not? Well, I think that we need to look into their incentive, their behavior, motivation. And I'm, I, I know all the agents, you know, the government, the political leaders, they're all rational person. And the rationality means what? They are pursuing something which are good for themselves. But what are good for the politician, especially for the national leader? I think that their main goals are two. The first one, 
they want to stay in power as long as possible. The second one, if they can stay in power, they want to have a good name in history. And, uh, and what would be the way for them to achieve those two goals? I think the best way is to bring prosperity to the nation. If they can bring in inclusive growth, prosperity to the nation, then they will be supported, they can stay in power, they will have a good name in history. But the issue is that since Adam Smith to now, we still do not have a formula for a politician to follow and uh, there will be the chance of success is high. And uh, in my new structure economics, I review the intellectual agenda. And I find so far, if a country follow the intellectual agenda in the mainstream ideas, it's a guarantee for failure. I did not see any country are successful by following the mainstream ideas. And those of successful countries, in general, their policy were perceived as a wrong policy when they are implementing those kind of policy. And so here very much depends on whether as an intellectual communities we can come up with some kind of understanding which can really help the country, the politician to implement and to be successful. Well, we, I think we're still far away from that, but at least new structural economics hope to push forward one step forward. And uh, if we work together and come up with a framework, and a simple and easy to implement and uh, can the chance of success is very high. I'm sure all the politicians will be, have such a high incentive to improve. And, and, and uh, that's what I found when I travel around. And all the politicians wanted to talk to me. And I can give one example. The president of Rwanda, he wanted to talk with me about the new structural economics and how to facilitate the implementation of the policy in Rwanda. He came to China in September last year. And I happened to be away during his period. He stayed in China for two days in order to wait for me to come back a president. So I think that they have the incentive. And certainly, all the top leaders, if they have those kind of policy right, and they can see the effect, they will implement. But you can say, well, no, no most politicians are so corrupt and so on. I think the reason why they are so corrupt was because they have wrong policy, they cannot deliver the prosperity, and uh, so under the kind of situation, they want to stay in power, so they need to consolidate the control, they need to build up their you know, clients and so on, and so that's bringing more distortion. And even with those kind of distortion, they are not, so, they are not sure they will stay in power. So they need to accumulate wealth for two purposes. If they have to step down, they still have enough money to spend, or they have enough money to come back. And also that's the reason why they become so corrupt. So I think that all, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if we have a good ideas and that really work, I'm sure the politicians they will follow. They will have incentive to do that. Then regarding the implementation of this cross facilitation and so on, which level of government should implement the policy? I think that very much depends on what type of facilitation we are talking about and also depends on what level of the development. If it's you know, supporting the human capital formation or supporting the basic research, then certainly should be the national government. But many type of industries, they must be happen in certain localities. And those kind of facilitation should be carried out at the local government. Level. So we should analyze what kind of facilitation we are talking about, and then we can see what level of government should play the role. Then coming to the country, the issue of the country. Yes, the country in general, they have different regions with different level of development. And because most of the facilitation should be carried out at the local level from the gross identification, because of the nature of those kind of activities. So I think that uh, even for a large country, by nature, the facilitation of them should happen in a local level. So the country, the, level, the, the, the region with different level of development, certainly they can have their own different facilitation policy and for different type of industries. 
Then coming to the issue of investment, and then you can see, yes, East Asian countries, in general, they have a very high investment, high saving and high investment. But saving and investment actually is, is endogenous. In a sense, I argued yesterday, you make an investment in sector which are consistent with your competitive advantages, they will be so competitive. They can generate a lot of economic surplus, so you have more to save. And also, if you make investment in those areas, the return to your capital will be high. So you have more to save, and your incentive to save will be high, so saving rate will be high. And the investment will also be, will be high. And I do have two empirical evidence to support me. Like East Asian countries, they did not come start with a very high saving rate. For example, Korea. Before the 1960s, their rate of saving was less than 10%. Less than what you know uh, 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 was required for takeoff. But now they all have a very high saving rate, more than 30 percent, close to 40 percent. How come? Because they make investment in areas which can generate high profit and also high return to the investment. And, and so I think it's endogenous. And you can start with what we have now, look into what sector you have competitive advantages, turn that into a very competitive process of of growth, then the saving rate will increase as a result. Then the, then the next question, China's factor. Now China has been the, the workshop uh, of the world, and uh, China may crowd out other countries' opportunities. But China not only crowd out the Eastern European country, China also crowd out Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, mm -hmm. right? So the key is, that yes, you have a global competition. And then with this kind of growth competition, you always need to identify the sectors where you can continue to upgrade. And that is the way to increase your income, right? If you only want to enter into the, the product that China produced today, then your wage rate, your income level will be the same as China. And uh, most of the, the East European country, your per income is higher than China, right? So if you wanted to produce what China produced today, then your income will be less than 6,000 US dollars. But most of them already more than 10,000 US dollars. So that means you need to upgrade to your, your industry, upgrade to higher value added sector. And China also faces a similar situation, right? Now China per capita income is 6,000. That, that, that Vietnam is only 1,500. And an African country is less than 1,000. So China also faces this kind of competition, right? So that is the reason why, you know, structural transformation, structural changes is a continual process. And the private sector and the government always need to be on top of, you know, on top of this tool to, to, to continue to upgrade, continue to improve. So there's no excuse. Don't use China as excuse for the failures in your country. <laughs> then the from I, I, I think that different theory try to explain for different purposes. Certainly, I agree, if you look into a country, only a small percentage of firms, they are exporting. But even for that one percentage of firms are exporting, can a low-income country export capital intensive, technological intensive goods to the US market? or to European market. No, that one percentage of firms are still exporting according to their factory balance. And, and so, you know, we, when we apply the theory, we, we need to know how we try to explain. How we try to explain is that if a country wants to have an industry to be competitive on the international markets, then what should be the nature of that industry? And we are not trying to explain how many firms in a country that can participate in this kind of international trade? It's for different purposes. So, so, so you know, we need to apply the deal in the right way. And also, in addition to that, for example, that uh, Paul Krugman emphasized on specialization. And uh, how come I emphasize the factor in law? Again, it's a different purpose. Specialization try to explain country at a similar level of development. That means their factory environments are roughly the same. And how come they, uh, they have trade? 
certainly its country is specialized on certain things. And so if you look into the poor groupman's model, in general, you assume the factor environments are the same. And then try to explain when a country has the same factor environment, how you're going to have a trade. So, and so it does not mean that factor environment is not important. So Paul Grumman also said, if you want to explain country in different level of development, then the most important explanation for their trade are factor environments. But if you want to explain country at a similar level of development, then factor environment certainly is not important for explaining how come trade occurred. And, uh, and then specialization becomes important. Heterogeneous firm had the same purpose. Then the last one about the transferabilities of the experiences. I would say it's not Chinese experience, it's East Asian experiences. Whether it's transferable or not. First, let's consider. In the 1950s and 1960s, East Asian was considered the least of area. At that time, no one had confidence that East Asian can make it. Now East Asian make it. And, and under this kind of situation, whether the East Asian experience can be applied to other countries. Certainly, you cannot directly imitate it. But there's some spirit that can be useful. I think the spirit is that, well, as I said, that, you know, before the lunch, I said, in the past, most people always use high-income country as a reference. And they try to imitate what the high-income country had or what the high-income country could do well. But East Asian economies, they have some different, you know, uh, mindset. They always look into what they have now. And based on what they have, what they can do well. And then try to, you know, scale up what they can do well. I think that if you use that approach, I would say every country has the opportunities. And I started to do some experiment in Africa. For example, no one really are convinced that African country can be a global processing industry center to export goods to compete in international markets. And, and actually, you know, most people think it was impossible because institution is too weak, infrastructure is too poor, and they don't have those kind of heritage. They don't have, have those kind of history at all, right? But if you want to look into, if you want to look into the labor intensive processing industries, you understand labor cost is the most important cost of their total cost. And other consideration only ate up the transaction cost. Okay. And then, if you identify some kind of labor intensive industry which cannot produce the day, but which will really increase so fast. And under this kind of situation, if you relocate those kind of production to African country, the wage cost saving will be so large. For example, I, I you know, you know, I, in 2011, I went to Ethiopia and I talked to the late Prime Minister Malas and I made one analysis for him. I said, well, if you look into the laser product, laser shoes, Ethiopia produced laser. They had the second largest uh, 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 animals, you know, in, buff, uh, in cow and animals in, in, in Africa. So they were surprised to one them. And they had a large young population. Labor cost is only about one tenth of the labor cost in China. And 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 the digital shoe sectors, that sector contribute, you know, the labor cost, wage rate, was about 25% of total total cost. So by moving the production from China to Ethiopia, the firm can save more than 20% of total cost. Okay, then logistic cost increase, transportation cost increase, government were very efficient in the cost increase. But the government can say, this is my priority sectors. So the government always has the ability to make an instruction to the custom, say, well, all the logistics to give the first priority to come, 
and, 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 and the electricity is a shortage, but I want to guarantee that this industrial park will have enough electricity. And about those kind of commitment, then I advise the, the late Prime Minister to go to China to do the investment promotion. And uh, he picked up my advice. So I met him in March 2011. He went to China in August 2011. And then he met some of the shoemakers. We invited them to visit us. So there one delegation went to others in October 2011. And after they went there, they saw, well, Ethiopia, you know, was quite stable socially, politically. And labor costs was much lower, and so on, as I analyzed. So one was convinced to make investment, and they recruit 86 workers who were training, sent back to China for training for three months. They started to put up a production line in January. 2012, and employee 600 workers. They started to shift their export to the US market and the, and the, and, and, and the European market, designer shoes. And by May 2012, you know, five months later, that firm became the largest exporter of Ethiopia. By October, the same year, last year, that firm turned profit, break even, started to make profit. By the end of the year, the employment grew from 600 to 1,600. And I went back to see the firm in February this year. That employment increased to 2,300 already. They had a plan to expand the employment to 4,000 by the end of this year. And they have a plan to build up a cluster of 50,000 within about five years. And so it's possible. You know, I think that if we really learn the spirit to look into what they have their endowment structure and then do a very careful calculation about the factor cost of production and then try to remove the transaction cost, even African country can become a global manufacturing center. So I, I think that in that spirit, I think that there's something can be learned, but certainly how to make that happen, then you need to have a different analysis because the barrier will be different. So by that, let me conclude, and I really appreciate the opportunity of change with you, and I hope that we can help not only African countries, we can also help European countries, both you know, Eastern European countries, former civilian, or even the Eurozone to become prosperous in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think this would be a nice uh, occasion to close the, the, the meeting. And I would like uh, uh, first to remind us we started two days ago with this idea transition economic meets new structural economics, which I think now after two days, uh, I think was a fully justified idea in the sense that uh, we very often sit in our corners, uh, not only physical, but conceptual, theoretical, whatever, and, and uh, filtering you know, uh, of that and bringing new ideas is extremely useful. And I think this was a very, very uh, refreshing and that we all learned from that. And I think that all wouldn't be possible without uh, Justin. So I would like us to give him a one. Uh, yeah. uh, to all uh, speakers for your participation. We've learned uh, a lot of new aspects, again, within a relatively coherent perspective, uh, newly one uh, emerging. And um, I would like to say that for people that were not here, uh, we will not leave them in the darkness. We will try to make uh, what is happening here uh, visible to, to um, people that are not uh, privileged to, to spend these days with us. So we will first uh, upload your presentation. So if you have any problems with that, please let us know as soon as possible. We are videoing this. Uh, that's the second thing. So please also um, tell us if you have any problems. We are also um, working on this thematic issue of general economic policy reform, which is a thematic issue which is co-edited by me, Eric, and uh, uh, Justin. And authors that have your papers presented here, we will contact you in uh, in, in due time.